You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Welcome to Curtain Up, the program that tells you about Russian culture in London. We've got news and views about the capital's most exciting exhibitions, films, concerts, plays, and festivals with a Russian flavor. With me in the studio today are Julian Gallant, the director of Pushkin House, and Dr. Thierry Morel. Dr. Morel is an art historian and the man behind an upcoming exhibition of 18th century art from the Hermitage. This is an exhibition with a fascinating story behind it, isn't it? Yes, because this is one of the most important collections, European collections, which was bought by Catherine the Great in 1779. And it's a collection also of, of a very important character because he was the first Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of England. And it's also one of the most important artistic collections in terms of the range of artists that it counts. Could you give us some examples? Of course. I mean, ranges from Rembrandt, Velázquez, Poussin, Murillo, Van Dyck, Rubens, Le Sueur. I mean, so you see, it's, it's literally uh, the top. So Incredible collection, isn't it? Thierry, you are, you are, of course, an absolute, you know, the Hermitage backwards. And you, you've had long, long involvement with it. It's difficult to know the, the Hermitage backwards. <laughs> well, the question as is... As much as I try. Yeah. <laughs> Have these works been on public display in the Hermitage for all those 250 years? Well, actually, some of them have been. They had a, a very fascinating history because they were shipped from England to St. Petersburg. And then, of course, there was for the, the Hermitage of Catherine the Great, of so her own museum. And then, little by little, as years went by, the Tsars of Russia decided to display those works publicly. But occasionally, and it's interesting, a few pictures were picked, hand-picked by either the Tsarina or the Tsar to be selectively displayed in their own apartments. And then, of course, during the, just before the Second World War, a few pictures got sold. And Why were they sold and who... who in, the tw in the 20s and late 20s and early 30s. Well, I think Russia was in need of um, funds and some works had to be sold, sadly. But what's quite interesting is the, the Hermitage staff was always incredibly protective of those works, and they did everything they could to save them. And so sometimes they would hit the pictures in order Hide to them. disobey <laughs> the orders from above and keep the pictures safely at, at the Amitage. The Amitage is an extraordinary place, isn't it? I mean, I've heard a story, and you're probably going to say this is not true, but the Amitage, if the whole contents were sold, it would pay for America six times over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> now, how did you select? You couldn't bring the whole collection. How did you select no. which ones you wanted to bring? And what was the process of getting the ball rolling? Because we all know that that's, that's not a simple thing to do. First of all, I should say that Sir Robert, the Prime Minister, was living in Downing Street before he, he moved to his country estate called Houghton Hall. And he had this, this amazing Palladian mansion built for the collection. Especially. Especially, <laughs> especially for the collection. And that's out in the countryside, isn't it's, it? It's, uh, it's not far from London and it's next to Sandringham, the Queen's right. uh, shooting mm -hmm. estate. And what he did is he commissioned the best architects of the time, Gibbs, William Kent, to design the best possible temple for his art collection. And therefore the artists, and William Kent in particular, who was in charge of the interiors, had the pictures in mind. Mm. They had seen them, they knew what they looked like, their format, their subject matters. And William Kent, for instance, designed the rooms as a kind of a project. Around of, the paintings. Around the pictures. So in fact, those designs have been preserved, and we're going to display them as well. So they show how the, the hang was, was mm. done, or at the least was project. intended. Mm. Sure. And of course, the inventories also have survived. That's why we are able to reconstruct the interiors of, of the house as they were. Is the house in its, in its 18th century state, or has it been added to a lot over the no, years? No, that's the beauty of it. The house actually has been completely preserved. It's one of the rare, rare examples in, in Europe, in fact, mm. in the world, of a house which has been left almost untouched. Mm. So to come back to, you, to Julian's question, it's basically we, we, we try to reconstruct the, the rooms as best as mm. possible, and really sometimes absolutely identically. So all the pictures we, we selected are the pictures which were there in the first place. So that was the main, I see. The, the main <laughs> way we, we chose the painting. Yeah. What, about, what about the whole process? Some people might think it's possible to just drive up, up a truck to the museum, the Hermitage, ask permission if they could, wouldn't mind lending the pictures and drive <laughs> the truck back. That's probably not, it's probably not as simple as that, not is it? Not quite. <laughs> there. I don't think, uh, Professor, the Pachowski would would uh, yes <laughs> would so, be keen. This. So why is he allowed? Why is he allowed these these marvels to come out? I think the 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 curators and and the directors and the exhibition committee of of the Hermitage 
have agreed to this because they, they saw the historical importance and significance of this reconstruction. And it's also a very wonderful way of, of showing the, the history of the Hermitage and highlighting mm. its importance in terms of historical importance, but also artistic importance. Mm. When you see all those masterpieces there reunited in this, in this temple which was created for them, you, you realize what a great choice it was uh, and what an inspired purchase Catherine had done. Well, uh, that's, that's quite typical of Catherine, isn't it? She was very much into the arts, all kinds of, of the arts, and so I'm not surprised she made that kind of purchase thinking about the recent exhibition also from the Hermitage that's in, currently in, on in Scotland. Scotland. Mm. Yes, which I mm. saw, which I love. Mm. The, well, Catherine the Great is, as you know, is one of the most extraordinary rulers in world history. I mean, it's when you think, I mean, being a Frenchman, when I realised, when I saw the, uh, the, the house, the, the, uh, Voltaire, the copy she made of, of Voltaire's house, and the fact that she corresponded with Voltaire and Diderot and, uh, mm. and, and so the learned uh, men of the time. And then when you read her writings, her memoirs and so forth, I mean, you realise what an extraordinary personality she was. And she was not, in fact, Russian to start with. She was, she? she was German yeah. to start with. She was German, so, but learnt the Russian language and became, and, and, and mastered it or mastered that, became very much involved with Russian culture and, um, you know, thought about uh, involving Russia with the rest of Europe as well. In fact, she mm. became more Russian than the Russians, really. Mm. And, uh, and, and I think one should say that nationality really comes with uh, a passion for mm. the for the land, you know, mm. for the for the country, mm. and and she definitely had that. And, and and a wide and a wide view of the arts. You know, it wasn't just opera and theatre. No. She liked, you know, she bought this collection of art. She wrote the first Russian children's story. So a kind of Renaissance woman, if you like, mm. in, oh, in that sense. You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. This is Curtain Up, the program about Russian culture in the capital. I'm Alice Lanyado, and with me in the studio are Julian Gallant, the director of Pushkin House, and art historian Dr Thierry Morel. What about getting back to another aspect of Julian's question? What about the practical side of getting this exhibition mm. over? As Julian hinted, it's not just a matter of... Well, no, we, all know, we all know the story about the From Russia exhibition, don't we, in, in, in um, 2009, that there was a threat of seizure. Uh, there's legislation now in place that, that state assets cannot be touched and so on. So, so there's that history behind it. It's, 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 it's partly that. And it's also interesting to know just how you transport these kind of Indeed. miracles. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Well, all those works, and also I should add, actually, that the collection was, wasn't left in one place. I mean, most, the, most of the paintings are the Amitage. Mm. But a few pictures were dispatched to other museums okay. uh, in the course of, of, of right. the 20th mm. century. And so a few pictures are now at the Pushkin Museum. And in Moscow. The, in Moscow, mm -hmm. exactly. And others are at uh, Tsarsko mm -hmm. and others at Pavlovsk, and others Various at... Various estates in yep. Russia, mm -hmm. exactly. so, yes. don't know. And, and, and other, uh, other museums. Uh, Khabarovsk and so mm. on. Mm. So, so those pictures will have to be transported separately. Mm. And obviously, there's Goodness. a for security reason you don't put all the pictures in the same mm -hmm. load, so you you won't have sure. all those. Um, so it's a, it's a very very complex and big infrastructure. Mm. So the best art transporters are, are used, which are the ones that the Amitage only mm. uses or the Pushkin. And it's a, it's, a, it's a, a gigantic operation. Are they are, are they deframed the pictures or are they are they just no the pictures are not are not are not deframed. Uh -huh. uh, they are sent with their friends, mm. except one painting because one painting we discovered, and it's a poussin. Uh, it's a picture which is a very important uh, picture of the Holy Family, one of the best masterpieces uh, of Poussin. We realized that actually the frame was left at Houghton. Wow. Isn't that so incredible? The original frame that ah. was designed by Kent. So this frame we're going to try to... Reunite. Are you reunite with the painting? Are painting? you really? I mean, yes. So you will Wonderful. actually be, be taking a Poussin and you will be framing the, the, the Poussin. In the, yes. That is extraordinary. To <laughs> ask a very basic question, how are the paintings shipped over? What kind of transport is best? How does that work and how long does it take? The exact, well, I haven't been transported yet. It will be sort of a combination of uh, trucks, sort of road transport and ship. But mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I'd rather remain sort of... Yeah. <laughs> I think they should be should be kept quite discreet. <laughs> Ab absolutely, but yeah. you're not expecting any problems of the kind we've seen in the past with customs. I don't think so because it's it's there's no there's, there's no, no question, question of, of provenance. Mm. Mm. <laughs> we know. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I think the, the Russian museums are, are, are all behind it. The one thing I should add, actually, is, is that the, I received, when I suggested this idea, an immense support from museum curators and directors of the various museums mm. I, I in mentioned. Russia. In, in Russia. Russia. Mm. Yes. They were incredibly helpful, and without their support it would never have happened. Mm. But I think it shows their... Their vision. Yeah. So, have you been trying to get this project off the ground for some time, or is yes, it? Yes, it took it took about three years. That's not really long in. in it's in not very long in those terms, especially for the for the uh, for the size of the, mm. the the scale of it. Mm. And a few works of art will come also from the United States, right. because during the the sales in the 30s, a few works were were sold to Mr. Mellon, for instance, mm -hmm. or Mr. Mm -hmm. Gulbenkian. And so some works are at the National Gallery in Washington and others at the Metropolitan. And they have agreed also to lend them, Fantastic. inspired by the, mm. the Russian gesture. Do you see this theory, uh, I mean, uh, t looking at it a bit wider, do you see this as a, is there a, a political gain from this? Is there, is, is there a development of the relationship between Russia and Britain? Well, is, I very, is I very much hope so, benefit? because mm. I very much hope so. I mean, I think Catherine knew, knew perfectly well that through art she could improve sort of relationship with those countries and also the um, economical aspect of it. And I believe that ignorance is the reason why people don't communicate. And I think this, such an exhibition should really allow the Russian people and the English people to, and, and in fact the, the world to, to understand each other better. I find, I think, I mean, in my experience, I find that Russia is, is, is not well known. I mean, the mm. way uh, Russian culture and Russian people are not. Um, I mean, will the British Prime Minister come along to... Uh, we should, we should, you should ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but I very much hope that it will be embraced by all sides, really. Are you, are you, are you planning to do special... I mean, how, how are you going to... I, mean, I don't like to use the word market it, but how are you going to make the, uh, get everybody to know about this and make sure that, that, that nobody can say, oh, I didn't know it was on? Well, we, we, I mean, from, from this interview and, mm. and, and afterwards, we'll have a, an article in, in the Mail on Sunday mm -hmm. uh, about the, uh, the exhibition. So from now on, I hope people will, and we've got a marketing campaign, which hopefully will reach everybody, both in Russia and in the rest of the world. I mean, obviously, it isn't far from London, but it's still slightly harder, possibly. Well, it's very, very easy access. You know, there's a, there's a train that goes every every hour, and and we'll also will will increase the, the the means of transportation to make it as easy as possible. You mean from the station or whatever? Exactly from the station mm -hmm. right. or from London. Yes, mm -hmm. and also we will have coaches and so forth. So I think it should Wonderful. be as easy as possible. And then then also it's an added bonus because it's one thing to see artworks in a, in an urban setting. But to see those works in the magic mm. grounds of, of Houghton Hall and Norfolk, it will be spectacular. And I think it will, it will be a, an experience that you won't forget ever. And it's also once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So I think it's worth doing a little more effort because you, it will be rewarded, I think. And of course there are young Russians in London who've been brought up here who may not have been to the Hermitage very much and would like to go as well. I know that Russians flock to major Russian art exhibitions and mm. theatre productions here, so you've got those 200, 300,000 people as well. Yes, and then uh, just to tell you, I mean, even if, if the exhibition is not announced, we've already had requests from groups, from curators, yeah. from patrons of the art to come and to... So I think it's, it's a good sign. It means people are excited and it's something different and, mm. and new. So. I think I can only, I mean, I, I've been there so many times that I, I, can, I, can, I can vouch for you that it's, it's the most amazing place. I mean, uh, Nicolas Penny, the director of the National Gallery, actually said it will allow you to, to think, to see those works in a, in a, in a different light. They may be, some of them may be familiar for those who know the Hermitage, but when you see them there, it would be another experience. And I think that's going to be going to be uh, historical. There's no doubt that to see a work in in the private setting where it was originally conceived, rather than in the on a, a neutral museum wall, I think that this actually is, to, to be fair, yeah. the, the Hermitage or the other museums are not neutral. You know, mm. they are, they are wonderful spaces mm. in any mm. case. But yeah. but it's just a particular design that was mm. created for them. So mm. so that's that's quite special. Yeah. Well, wonderful. sounds fantastic, and, and we all look forward to that. Thank you very much for coming on our programme, Dr. Morel, Dr. Thierry Morel, and thank you to Julian Gallant again for joining us today in this edition of Curtain Up. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. This is The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Stay with us.
Just some examples. Of course, I mean, ranges from Rembrandt, Velasquez, Poussin, mm. Murillo, Van Dyck, Rubens, Le Sueur. I mean, so you see, it's, it's literally uh, the top. Incredible uh, the collection, isn't it? Thierry, you are, you are, of course, an absolute, you know, the Hermitage backwards, and you, you've had long, long involvement with it. It's difficult to know the, the Hermitage backwards. <laughs> well, the question as is... As much as I try. Yeah. <laughs> Have these works been on public display in the Hermitage for all those 250 years? Well, actually, some of them have been. They had a, a very fascinating history because they were shipped from England to St. Petersburg. listening to the voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Welcome to Curtain Up, the program that tells you about Russian culture in London. We've got news and views about the capital's most exciting exhibitions, films, concerts, plays and festivals with a Russian flavour. With me in the studio today are Julian Gallant, the director of Pushkin House, and Dr. Thierry Morel. Dr. Morel is an... And then, of course, there was for the, the Amitage of Catherine the Great, of her own museum. And then little by little, as years went by, the Tsars of Russia decided to display those works publicly. But occasionally, and it's interesting, a few pictures were picked, hand-picked by either the Tsarina or the Tsar to be selectively displayed in their own apartments. And then, of course, during the, just before the Second World War, a few pictures got sold. And Why were they sold and who... who in, the tw in the 20s and late 20s and early 30s. Well, I think Russia was in need of um, funds, and some works had to be sold, sadly. But what's quite interesting is the, the Hermitage staff was always incredibly protective of those works, and they did everything they could to save them. And so sometimes they would hit the pictures in order Hide to them. disobey <laughs> the orders from above and keep the pictures safely at, at the Hermitage. The Hermitage is an extraordinary place, isn't it? I mean, I've heard a story, and you're probably going to say this is not true, but the Hermitage, if the whole contents were sold, it would pay for America six times over. <laughs> <laughs> art historian and the man behind an upcoming exhibition of 18th century art from the Hermitage. This is an exhibition with a fascinating story behind it, isn't it? Yes, because this is one of the most important collections, European collections, which was bought by Catherine the Great in 1779. And it's a collection also of, of a very important character because he was the first Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of England. And it's also one of the most important artistic collections in terms of the range of artists that it counts. Could you give us